30 second clips, that everybody's successful. It doesn't work that way. I don't think you understand the pain and the struggle. Anytime you see somebody flash their jets, their helicopters, their houses, you pay for it. How many of their clients have a jet because they bought their program? We need to show that here's what we did for other people as well. I made my first 10 million before I even taught real estate. Now, this is hard. If they tell you it's easy, nothing is easy. Network marketing is one of the greatest forms of growth. The breakdown believes when people buy about how much they make. The expectation that anybody who starts a network marketing or any business, real estate investing year one, is gonna make millions of dollars. But you have to do the short-term sacrifice for long-term benefit. The results don't lie, but people who don't have any do. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people, if you ask most people, hey, network marketing, so network marketing is a scam. It's not a scam. We now live in a society where nobody wants to take play, right? Network marketing is a scam. Great, how many calls did you make? How long were you into it? But it's a dangerous thing what you said there. We live in a society where people don't want to take blame. But yet it's the ownership of that mistake that makes you who you are. It's all about relationships. Most people don't do what they say they're going to do. Ouch. How you do one thing is how you do everything. Bam. I would say marketing is the most important thing because that's how you create your own economy. Any business that's based on referrals is not a business. If I'm branded, People come to me. Marketing is the engine of your business. Branding is the fuel. So branding is the most important thing to, to get me access to successful people. It's not how much it costs. It's how much it's going to make me. The PBD with the interest of the Yankees. I'm, I'm sure there's a thousand other examples to make more money. But to say that I want to be the New York Yankees, right? That's branding there. We just choose not to settle because we are seeking greatness. That is true entrepreneurism. Oh, you got one life. You got one chance. That's all you got. You got one chance. You got to go all in 24 7, 365. But at least go for it. Mic drop. Let's go. My guest today here in the Cowboys campus, hanging out here at the formation with JT Fox, business extraordinaire, coach of billionaires, being coached by billionaires to himself. And uh, we go back to Chi Town, man. So, JT, welcome here to the Seven Figure Squad Show, man. Too. You got bigger since I saw you. You got you, huge, man. I, you know, but yeah. you, you weren't as big as you are, and you weren't green. So oh, I got you. Now we got the the Hulkster here. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, oh, you talk about from the yeah. But look, look I, you, I you touch you. this, I mean, <laughs> you have to get insurance. To touch this, but once you touch it, you're like that. Those are those are really big. It's making me look really bad here too. So, but yeah, really funny. Go back to when we were both just starting out, right? Yeah. So you can take a look at you know networking, doing the things that people should be doing, yeah. and. You know, what's funny is you had my number, I had your number, but it wasn't until I saw you on a podcast somewhere else. I'm like, God, yeah. I know that guy. And I reached out DM and I, look, I, I, I typed in the name. I'm like, oh my God, he was in my phone. And I think there's a big lesson about following up. But I remember our first meeting yeah. very well. Very good. Yeah, it was, it was at a uh, real estate investing conference. Yes. And uh, I just remember how, how, how serious you were about business, how, how much you were impacting the real estate community, the shoulders and elbows you were rubbing against. And I remember a guy in the hallway and he's like, man, I don't want to get the head of my life. You're like, well, how many deals got in the pipe? Well, uh, uh, like you're like holding a guy accountable. He never had anybody in his life holding him accountable. And so that was, I thought it was very different. About I, I think it was a younger version of myself, you know, because I made my first million at 24, my second million at 25, and 10 million by the time I was 28, right? And during that time in Chicago, like I was a nobody, like I was somebody, mm -hmm. but I, you had to be like, is what I call like a, a sort of almost like a killer mentality because you're fighting, Chicago is a very competitive market in real estate. And, you know, I had like no filter, not that I don't have any more, but I was just very straightforward to the point. And I call people out, whatever I thought, I just called it because that's how I was coached and how other partners were there. And I think there's a lot of people who want to dream about what it is. And believe it or not, the first business advice I ever got was stop talking about what it done. Stop talking about it, get it done. So instead of like just overall just i want to do this i want to do this we're going to do this we're going to do hundreds of deals then he goes stop talking about it and get it done and that was a realization and then i just realized that a lot of people just want to talk about being entrepreneurs right take a look at social media yeah, yeah. and every you know 45 second clips 30 second clips everybody's successful it doesn't work that way i don't think people understand the pain and the struggle i mean i started i had a beeper i remember that i couldn't afford a cell phone <laughs> beeper you know we do a little image of what a beeper is, right? I'd like Gen Z is like, what's a beeper? Be yeah, what's a beeper? Yeah. <laughs> what's a they're, they're, they're like, what? You don't have an iPhone 13 yeah, yeah, or 14 right. or the, the 16. It's not even out yet, but it, it, it's not a beeper. And then people would have to call. And then I remember even calling the payphone. It's yeah. a different time. Yeah. When you're looking at where business and entrepreneurship was in your life, you were 
in Chicago. You're starting up. Why, why did you choose? There's so many things to get involved with in Chicago. Why real estate? Well, I, I lived in Canada, right? So I'm, I'm originally born from Canada. My mom was French. My dad was English. I had a speech impediment from eight to 24. I started and I had a French Canadian accent. And, you know, I, I wasn't a popular kid. I was introverted and I stuttered a lot. And so, and a lot of stuttering is self-confidence, right? Thinking three moves behind. And then I was, I want to go to law school, but not to be a trial lawyer, just to be a paperwork lawyer. And I didn't have the grades, but I'd saved up money and my parents were going through financial difficulties. So I gave them the money and I said, you know, you pay me back when I want to go to law school. And then sure enough, when it was time for me to go to law school, um, they didn't have the money to pay, pay me back. And so your whole dreams, everything is just kind of broken down at that point. And I went through a depression and I actually remember what it was like to be depressed. I'm just like sleeping and yeah. uh, in bed all day, like really have that feeling. I was 23 years old. And then I saw an infomercial, a late night infomercial, Russ Whitney. Uh, which goes ways back. And you can be rich in real estate too. So I show up to a seminar. Yeah. Blue book. Yeah, Blue right, book, yeah, right, yeah. And show up to a seminar and you can get rich in real estate. And I remember, see, Canadians are skeptical of the American way, right? So you have an American going on. There's 500 people at a free preview. And the American's like, how many of y'all won't get rich? And I'm like, ooh, 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 ooh. I put my hand up, right? I was in the front row. How many people want like a Ferrari? Like, ooh, ooh. How many people want a Rolex? You know, and I'm like, ooh, ooh. And then he goes, and for the first 10, right now, right here. And I'm like sprinting to the back of the room. Like I'm sprinting because I want to be one of the 10. There's 500 people, right? Yeah. Good sales technique, right? Uh -huh. Still happens. Still people still do it today. Yeah. And I go in, I turn around. I'm the only one back there. There's 500 people in that room. I'm the only one signing up. And I turn around and I'm like, am I an idiot? No, I was like, whoa. And like, I'd been like, and I could see the people in the audience like, what a loser. Oh, you know I what I mean? Right. Like what a loser. Right. So then the guy grabs my hand. And maybe that's one of the greatest things that happened to me. And he goes, if you don't sign up now, you're going to be a loser for the rest of your life. Now, I had already been a loser for the first pass of my half. So I was like, wow, hey, what the heck? Yeah. You know, and then I did it. Did the three-day training. It was great. But it's like one of those things. And I think a lot of people can relate. Well, this is not the right training. You need to buy the next training, yeah. right? And that was $26,000. Different price was, point. Yeah. Right. It was the price of a car, right? That was a lot of money. Now, it seems nothing for what the cost of education cost. And, and even in Canada, I mean, if you go to school one year, it was 7,500, you know, in America it's over 25,000, 35,000, wherever you are. And so, and then I basically like bought it and then I'm like, well, it doesn't work in Canada. You need to move to America. And I'm a Canadian by that time. So, um, you know, I said one day I packed up all my pickup truck, 1988 rusted Ford Ranger, headed to the border, got all my stuff. And I remember saying, where are you going? I'm like shopping. Yeah. And they're like, yeah. pulled me over, took everything apart. And then headed to Chicago because I'd met, had a, a little, uh, you know, met people in the summer. You know, people on vacation are always more successful than where they are. Like everybody's a multi-million. It's like social media, but on vacation, everyone is wealthy. Everyone is successful. Yeah. Right. And then on vacation, we're on vacation yeah. and whatever they tell you divide by four. And so <laughs> I go to Chicago, we have this big search executive firm and, and we're successful, we'll help you in real estate and my stepson. So I moved there and I show up one man show. Like one a, office, yeah. like, you know, like yeah. that guy over there, that, that, that was his office, right? That was like, we won't sure, sure. that, that point office, over there, yep. right? Point over there, it's just <laughs> one office and he looks successful from that office, but yeah. um, it's a one man show. And then uh, everything that they sort of taught me didn't really work. Right. And yeah. so, but it started, that's how real estate investing started over um, when I first came to Chicago. So you had expectations to have this guy kind of help you out that, but you just lead into real estate. So can you tell us about your first deal? Let's say your first couple of deals. Well, the first thing is I, everything they taught me was kind of wrong. So that's okay. the problem is like go to real estate groups and you know, yeah. else, a bunch of people have no money and, yeah. and maybe there's one or two that have money, if that, and they're just, you know, they just like the attention. So the majority of people, like, they just sit there and they just don't do any deals, right? So I tried all that. And then the big mistake that I made, you'll understand that for those of you, Wilmette, Illinois, right? Well, sure. In Winnetka, nice. right? Nice area. Very nice area. Yeah. So I get this idea of putting offers. Right along the, right along the, the right coast. Right along the coast. Lake, Lake. All rich people. So it's like you come in here in Texas, Highland Park. Or where, pick the richest area where you live. And I put 1,000 offers, 50 cents on a dollar. So you can imagine how many people start yelling at me. And, you know, looking back, there should have been, if there's no motivation, it doesn't matter how great anything. If there's no motivation to sell, yeah. you're a bunch of wealthy people. They start yelling at me and became lowball kings. So I'm like three weeks in America and I think I was going to get deported because <laughs> everyone was, was you're offending everybody. Yeah, I'm offending everybody. And, and then it kind of, and then, you know, I called the coach and you could tell some guy in a cubicle that's never done real estate. That's reading off a script, telling me go to a real estate group, which I had done. And then I realized what's the motivation. And I decided to write a letter by accident to people in foreclosure because a lot of foreclosures in, you know, Illinois, especially mm -hmm. Chicago, uh, and it was like, Hey, 
I don't know what I can do, but let me try and see if I can work something with the bank. I called myself a loan mitigation officer, which I was a term I pretty much invented. I don't know yeah. why. Yeah. And which is pretty forward thinking. Well, yeah, well, I, I, like I had a name Harrison and Gallagher, right? And that's because it was my, my partner's, my first partner's son's name. So people thought I was a law firm and I wasn't, but it made them call me ironically enough, but I never said it was a law firm. And then my first deal was in Moni, Illinois. Uh, but it was interesting. It's one of the greatest lessons that I think I've learned. I'm glad I did this. I go in, they, they, they send a thing, we're in foreclosure, we have 30 days left, we tried everything, it didn't work. So I go there, Moni, Illinois. So, you know, where I was, it's about an hour drive, right? Um, and though both people are disabled and I'm working on the, the deal, I call the bank, I try to see if they work out an agreement and then I put the house on the market and an offer comes in um, and then another offer comes in and then the bank says, fine, well, I'll do a short sale. Except I, one of the offers is, I think I would have made like $20,000, which is at that point, I was negative, 34,000 in the hole. But this other offer, see, they owed 387 on the house and they put an offer of 290 and I got the bank to take 202. Okay. So you can imagine, yeah. right? Yeah, the difference. But here's the thing too, they put an offer in at 420. Now at that time, I'm like, I don't care what you offer. Go to closing, ready to close, all of a sudden, the feds come in, no. shut the whole thing down. What happened? Well, because it was like that straw buyer thing, right? The house oh, is worth oh, 300, you. right? Yeah. Because they owed more than what the house was worth. This guy had a buyer at 420, most likely like forged, the documents of the straw buyer, yeah. right? And they was gonna buy from me for, you know, for 290, they uh -huh. had 420, they were gonna take the spread and not pay the stuff. The feds cut it down, they shut the deal down, the bank with, with, yeah, withdrew yeah, the of offer, and my first deal, I actually lost it. And I was devastated. Holy moly. Because here's the problem, ignorance of the law should not be an excuse. And you can't say I'm new, because at the end of the day, you have two people, both disabled, who I let down. And they're like, no, we didn't expect you to do that. But I had the deal done. If I had taken the other offer where it was a 270 or, or 260, I would walk away $20,000 and I would save them for foreclosure, right? Couldn't give them any money back because the yeah. bank was taking a loan. And they felt so bad. And they said, well, we know this deal in Pieton, which is right next door. Um, you know, they were going to build an airport, which they never did. You know how it is. Like, sure. we're going to build an airport there. Yeah, yeah. And they said, we know of a deal. And if you want, and they told me about this deal. And uh, I did a deal. And my first deal was $75,000. So even though I lost that deal, I still made $75,000 on another deal because they referred me. Yeah. And then I gave them a piece, of course. And to me, the biggest lesson, trust but verify, never assume, ignorance of the law is there. If it sounds too good to be true, it usually is. And at the end of the day, I let somebody down. And I never, and since then, still have not done that. And I've done thousands of deals and own over 70 companies and brands. Mm -hmm. I do business in 55 countries. Never let anybody down that there because I felt like that. So the first deal ended up being not a deal, but ended up being one of the greatest lessons I think I've learned that even to this day, it just gives me chills to thinking about that I fail because I was not aware. JT, you and I have been around the biz world for 20 plus years now. We've got, we've got some uh, length in our, in our teeth. So you got white hair, I <laughs> for the record. You just shave yours. No, I don't. <laughs> I, I've had this little spot for, but because it's a birthmark for a long time. So you, you got, you got grayer. Your muscles got bigger, but you got gray. Got your little beard and everything. It's, uh, it's children, it's children. Now it's I'm, I'm granddad, so it's, it's going to be a future grandchild. That's going to give me more white hairs. But we were talking about uh, gurus and fake gurus. Mm -hmm. We've seen them both in person, and now we're seeing them online. What tips you off? What, what sends you a red flag that someone's possibly a fake guru? Personally, personally, okay, personally, I will tell you. Anytime you see somebody flash their jets, their helicopters, their houses, right? You pay for it. Let's take a look at the world's most successful people. Elon Musk will brag about living like in a box near SpaceX or sleeping on the floor of the conference table. Yeah. Jeff Bezos owns one of the biggest yacht. Mm. He doesn't post it. Why do we post? We post because we think that stuff is important, right? You think that a nice watch or a nice car or all of that is going to make you happy. You know what makes you happy? When you first get the, the first day, a week later, it's like, ugh. Yeah. Then you got to make the insurance payment thing. Uh, I make all these payments. Maintenance. But, but here's the thing. The, I know I do business with billionaires. I know the world's most successful people. They don't flash their stuff. And they're only flash that they're selling you something. You know what you should ask yourself? How many of their clients became have a jet because they bought their program? How many of them have a Lambo before they bought the program? 
Even better yet, how many of their clients have flown on their private plane? How many of their clients have, uh, have driven in their car? That's what we need to show. We need to show that here's what we did for other people as well. Yeah. And so we live in a society that people fake it till they make it. They'll maybe do two or three deals. I made my first 10 million before I even taught real estate. Now, I, you know, do all kinds of stuff, all kinds of businesses. I mean, countless businesses now. Yeah. And I think that's the, the biggest issue. And people don't know. And I think they use a lot of hype, yes or yes, good or good. Uh, you know, I made millions of dollars with no work. Let me tell you something. Business is hard. If they tell you it's easy, nothing is easy. Nothing. Nothing. And I think that's the, the big problem. I just have a problem with people showcasing their wealth um, because I think at the end of the day, they're only doing it either to get views or to get people to buy the stuff. That's just my philosophy. There's nothing wrong. Like there's someone that I know is very successful. Like, he's always on the, on the car collector or he's on a plane and showing stuff like, mm. but he's not selling anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm okay with that. Yeah, yeah. I just have a problem. There's a course tied to it. That's just me personally. You know, we uh, had this company in Chicago. I mean, they were, yeah, they're doing a lot of rah-rahs. I mean, we do rah-rahs, but their version of rah-rahs to get you there to go buy the real estate investing course I mean, without dropping any names. But, you know, the company I'm talking about, they're yep. a lot in Chicago. And I just asked a guy, so this is awesome. You, you, you've made $100,000, $200,000 with this thing selling real estate courses and showing people how to invest in real estate. Says, can I ask you a question? He says, what's that? How many deals, how many of these deals have you, that you're selling information to do have you actually done? And he goes, well, I'm working on my first one right now. So you've made six figures, not by investing in real estate, but you made six figures by selling education, investing in real estate. And it's kind of the problem with network marketing. Network marketing is one of the greatest forms of growth to grow a business, to grow a network. The breakdown believes when people lie about how much they make, yeah. right? And that undermines yeah. that. And the expectation that anybody who starts a network marketing or any business, real estate investing year one is going to make millions of dollars. If you mm -hmm. say something, listen. Dedicate the next five years to your life doing this. Mm -hmm. you probably won't make a lot of money year one, two, and three. You'll start making money year four. By year five, you'll be up going. Do it another five years. I guarantee you, you'll have an uh, eight figure net worth and maybe even higher. You'll get all to the other things, but you have to do the short term sacrifice for long term benefits. And, but it's not sold as the pain, yep. right? And I remember when I first got to network market, it was Excel Communications. I, I remember, remember that. I remember Excel. Yeah, Excel. I was in Excel. I was in Excel too. Yeah, I was and, in and, and by the way, very quickly, I yeah. end up doing very well. And then I did things that I didn't like. And, and looking back, I felt like, for example, I go to a meeting and I got a, a, a Mercedes, a Mercedes Benz keychain with mm -hmm. a Mercedes key. And I got caught up when I was like, you know, you're, that's not a Mercedes key and they're not cut up. I have a Mercedes, right? Because I was trying to pretend because that's you. what, you know, yep. and, and now I was 19, right? So I wasn't, I didn't get it back then. And very quickly I became very successful. But then I remember the first minute, like 200, 200, 200, 200, 200, 200, right? They'd say that. Sure. And they're like, roll, I got a new car, high yeah. five. Yeah. And then you get behind the scenes because like you, I'm ambitious, I'm driven. I, I infiltrate the circle, who are the people? Because yeah. I want to be around the people who are successful. Turns out Rola got a car because of her job and she's not making money and, yeah. and I mean, infiltrated corporate. So I learned in a way for me, network marketing was probably the greatest business lessons of, you know, and then you celebrate, you close someone, but it don't mean anything until the check comes in mm -hmm. or, or they, they did their part. Um, but overall, it's a great model. It's just a lot of people have ruined it because of hype. And I think it goes back to whether we're hyping real estate, we're hyping our problem. Results don't lie, but people right. who don't have any do. And, um, and unfortunately, there's a lot of people, if you ask most people, hey, network marketing, I'll say network marketing is a scam. It, it's not a scam. You know, it, it, it's not. And I think that's a fundamental mistake that people make. But also, too, at some point, where's the responsibility of people to mm -hmm. take like, hey, listen, you got caught up in this particular hype. You have to bear responsibility. But we now live in a society where nobody wants to take blame, right? It's, yeah. If you point the finger at somebody else, maybe you have three fingers pointing at you. Yeah. And here's the thing, too. Great. How many calls? Network marketing is a scam. Great. How many calls did you make? How long were you into it? Yep. What did you do? Well, I did, didn't do anything. Or my friend's cousin's wife. Until you tried something, mm -hmm. right, and really put effort into something, right, then you can say something doesn't work. But we live in a society, oh, yeah, I, I, 10 people said no to me. Right, so. But it's a dangerous thing what you said there. We live in a society where people don't want to take blame. But yet it's the ownership of that mistake that makes you who you are. Yes or no, right? I get it. Wise man learns his mistakes while a genius learns from other people's mistakes. But just take a look at whether it's the pandemic or, you know, laws that are implemented that don't make sense. You need to say to yourself, 
you know what? We did the wrong thing. We should not have done this. We should not have shut down. We should not have done this. Here's what we should learn. We yeah. should have not silenced other people's opinions. And we shouldn't have maybe ostracized people. They want to take it. Maybe kids should never have whatever it is, right? Or any laws or anything. If people admit that they're wrong now, because it used to be as a society, and this is probably eight, nine, 10 years ago, maybe when, when you and I first started, I made a mistake. I'm sorry. Here's what I learned. Here's why it happened. Here's how I'm going to sure it never is going to happen. And then life moves on. We learn. But now they use it against you. Ah, you failed. Ah, you made a mistake. Ah, so blame is there. So much easier to deny and deflect blame. So no one takes responsibility for their mistakes because they use it against yeah. you. So at some, you know, if people came out and said, I'm sorry, this is what we should have done better. I'd probably have more respect. And I think it makes it worse now because now it just compounds the, you know, people double down because, hey, I'm already committed to this position. Yeah. And so if I make a mistake, I make a mistake. But I have coaches and I will bounce every decision for the last 13 years, every decision off coaches that I pay, by the way. And even now, 99%, I know it, right? If I know the answer. It's the 1% that can kill you because it's like right, driving a car, right? I'm going to go see Max Verstappen and at Red Bull F1 at the end of the month. And Very cool. See him, right? And, and I talked, I met Lando Norris uh, from McLaren. And I always tell the race car drivers, like, how do you drive and not die? I mean, you're going, you know, 200 miles an hour, right? And they think, if, if you think you're going to die, you're going to die. If you think you're going to fail, right, in general mm-hmm, business, mm-hmm. you're going to fail because that's what we're thinking. So sometimes what I want, is my coach say, you know what? That's a good decision. Now I have certainty. Even though I knew I need certainty so I can go in because yep. business is war. Business is a game, yep. right? Money's how you keep score, not driven by money. Then you go with certainty. That changes everything. So that 1% in terms yeah, of- Yeah, 1% the, are, are you looking for them to say, JT, this is not good. You're looking at 1%. Well, I, I mean, for me at this point, because I have so yeah. many businesses, you know, they call me the world's number one wealth and business coach. Like I, I I know what's going to work and what's not going to work, right? So, I, but a lot of my my things now at this point, every problem everybody has here has a first name and a last name. If you really think of all your problems, someone let you down, someone didn't do what they're supposed to do, right? I've never had like technology mess me up. Hey, the, you know what I mean? It, it's not like that. The, the iPhone died on us. It's the guys around us with the cameras who were who are <laughs> answers still, still, right? Who missed their B roll, right? But I'm, just, but I'm just saying, right? It's never like the iPhone failed us, right? And I think people fail us and it's all about relationships. And, and I think the hard part is most people don't do what they say they're going to do. Ouch. And the fundamental part of success, and by the way, how you do one thing is how you do everything. Bam. <laughs> Bam. I'm, so, I'm just going to get some green shirts get, and get, stuff get, like that. Yes, you will, man. You will. And uh, by the way, so far you've been watching, what's your biggest takeaway so far? By the way, should we see JT Fox in a green shirt? You know what I'm saying? I, I was going to wear a green tie, but I completely forgot. I dressed up and he was dressed like the Incredible Hulk. So <laughs> I forgot he's the green machine. <laughs> Every morning I have a smoothie, I think of you, brother. Come on, Every I see, morning. I see. So you have a green smoothie? I okay. both. I love, yeah, I love of course. I mean, what, what, what else color? If it's not green, it's not healthy. Ooh, here we go. Oh, wow. That's good <laughs> for you. That's good branding for you. It goes in, but it always comes out green. That's a different story. But uh, when you talk about Will this, be added out. Put it into the comments. <laughs> <laughs> JT, we're, we're, we're looking at guys that are building businesses. And for the majority of my audience there, they're either starting a business or they just are on the fence. You've made a lot of headway. You've accelerated your career success because of relationships and networking. So can you give us your, your top spiel and tips on how to be a better networker and find your ways to hire well, the, quality the, conversations? This, this, this may shock you. Uh, it doesn't shock you, but it'll put it in perspective. You do very well because you're branded. Right. So people say, what's the most important relationships? Not what you know. It's not who you know. It's who knows you. But who wants to network with people that have less success? Than them? Honestly, we all want to yeah, yeah, yeah. success up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. Sure. sure. Um, so sales are important. If you can't close, you can't succeed. Right. I always tell sales is about pitch, sell, close, pitch the why, sell the what, close the how. Always speak to people like, you know, that they're going to buy. Hey, when we do your insurance for you, when we partner together, when we invest together, because then you're opting them in, right? Rather than say, are you interested now? They got to opt themselves in. That means you are moving your disparity of power, which is you, because they need your product, your service, your investment, and it goes over to them. It's an empowering phrase. Right? It, correct. Yep. 
And then I would say marketing is the most important thing because that's how you create your own economy. Any business that's based on referrals is not a business. But here's the thing. If I'm branded, people come to me. If I'm branded, right, it's easier to sell because it's not like, no, why should I take you? When you're branded, right, marketing is the engine of your business. Branding is the fuel. So branding is the most important thing. And in a way, when you speak like you did a few weeks ago to 12,000 people, right? And then you could show pictures of this. When we're here in the Dallas Cowboy uh, Practice Facility Center, mm -hmm. right? That means you have some kind of access and pull because you're branded. Now, it didn't start like that. You don't, you know what I mean? Like that's the problem, right? So the brand is results, right? And the results is the most important thing. Don't say it, don't prove it. So go out there and get results. And at some point, anything that I um, can do that is going to give me the credibility, right? Um, to, to get me access to successful people, to get me in front of people, to be in a room with successful people, um, it's not how much it costs, it's how much it's going to make me. See, I, I tell people I have three rules of success, right? Every time I make any decision, personal, business, anything, I ask myself three things. What's the best thing that can happen? What's the worst thing that can happen? What's the most likely thing that can happen? Then five, four, three, two, one, decide. 95% of my decisions I make with my gut. My head, oh, I don't know, I gotta Google, what's wrong, what's wrong, I'm trying to find ways, I don't know time, all the excuses. Your heart, you gonna be like, rah, rah, get all excited. What does your gut say? That gut reaction to say, you know what, I'm gonna go with it as well. Your gut will make it. Number two, it's not how much money it costs, it's how much it's going to make you. Stop having a scarcity mentality. Marketing doesn't cost you money. Branding doesn't cost you money. I'm gonna put 5,000, how do I make 25,000? If I spend money on this, what is gonna be my ROI? There are things that you're not gonna get an ROI on. That I take longer to make a decision, like stuff, or, but anything that can make me better. Coaching, branding, positioning, environment, I don't think twice about it because I know. I said, why are you here at the Dallas Cowboys Center, right? Uh, to, to do this in office here, mm -hmm. uh, facility, very hard to get in, huge waiting list. And you said for the networking, right? Uh, right. That's exactly. the first thing you said. Sure. Why? Because I want access. So bingo. Because if I can meet the right yeah. people, and now because of that, you meet the Cowboys, you go to their practice facilities, yeah. you're able to do that. So you pay to have access. And that's what people want to do is that you know, sometimes you have to pay to get access, not because you're paying for it, because you want to be in front of the right people. You want to get in front of the line, yeah. right? And third, and probably the most important lesson, how much money are you willing to spend to lose the relationship? Um, you know, I so many deals and so many companies I own, I flew halfway around the world for 30 minutes and, I, and at first they're like, ah, I'm busy, I'm like, I'll fly to you. Like, if, if people are at your level or are more successful, you need to go to them. If they're below you, you can have come to you. But success, people say, oh, when you're in my town, come. Like, it, you need to go to people if you want those people. It takes one person, one deal, one opportunity to change the outcome of your life. So many people are impressed. They're like, oh, wow, I can't believe that you flew all the way here for 30 minutes. Then they feel bad, of course. Then they'll mm -hmm. like a couple hours mm -hmm. or then we'll go out to dinner as well. Right. And a lot of times that relationship, I didn't think it was necessarily the greatest deal. Like right now, I'm um, looking to, I've been Alfred, this is just this morning, uh, a restaurant in Nashville with a celebrity, right? A very big celebrity. And the RI sucks, it's 12%. And I make 30, 40% on everything higher, on every deal I do, right? And it's not a good deal. And it's gonna be five, 10 year hold. It's just it's yeah. like a horrible way to spend money. But you know what? For me to get in, to say that I'm involved in that business, yep. right? And to be partners, right? And then be associated with the celebrity at the bar. There's a value behind there, it. There's a value to this because I'm gonna get to that A-list A -list singer and that's gonna change my outcome and that's gonna infiltrate. So yeah. the branding that owned this restaurant and then from then on move from there. Yeah, yeah because you know you can say, I, I make a flat return on investment on whatever investment it is, but the intrinsic value of that networking connection, it's, it's a- uh, You know, we, we were talking about the car, the, the PBD with the interest of the Yankees. I'm, I'm sure there's a thousand other examples to make more money uh, on investments. But to say that I want to be the New York Yankees, right? Yeah. Or to say I own yeah. that, you know what I mean? Yeah. That just say. But then on the other side, let's take a Ryan, let's take a look at Ryan Reynolds. I started with acting. All right, I built my core. <laughs> what a great core. Right? And yeah. then all of a sudden, let me start the gym. Yeah. Boom, six hundred million dollar exit. Yeah. Yeah. Now let me buy this team that is like the worst yeah. soccer team in the worst league at the bottom of the bottom. Get a TV deal because he's famous. Mm -hmm. Get TikTok to be there, mm -hmm. right? And then boom, they get promoted. And yeah. then this weekend, they, this this summer. They were playing like exhibitions against Manchester United. 
Right? It's crazy. And then Mint Mobile, boom, $1.2 billion exit. And now Alpine Racing F1 team gave uh, him and Rob 23%, 21% of the company, and they put zero money in. Oh my That's branding there. And the same thing. Most of these celebrity endorsements, they don't have to put any money. Why? They build their brand. They work on the results, and then you work from there as well. I'm scratch. I'm nobody. I'm, I'm leaving the military. I'm making $20,000 a year. If I was to do this all over again, and I'm coming, you're my business coach. I want to be an entrepreneur. I'm a single dad of three kids. How do I start my brand, and what, what uh, should I be focusing on? Well, it, it's two things, right? So if you have to remember, do I have obligations, right? And if you have kids, mortgage, and stuff like that, you may have to get a job, right? Because sometimes starting from sure. scratch, yeah. you know, figure out, okay, if I'm not going to have a business, right? If I'm not going to have a job, I have a certain amount of money. How much could I, could, what's my runway? Let's just to say that they can do that. I got six, seven months that you figure out how much can I realistically make? Because the best case never happens, unfortunately, right? Mm -hmm. If it is, it's lucky, but you know, yeah. it's like, it, so I would make sure that I have enough runway. And people sometimes say, well, I only have like five grand left, but I know I'll make money. That to me, always reverse engineer the process, right? You want to make a million dollars a year? That's 83,000 a month. 19,777 a week, 2,700 hours a day. So now you need to know how many clients or deals do I need to make, let's say to make 2,700 hours a day. But now it's more than that. How many leads do I need to do? So I have three buyers to get that, let's say. But how many leads do I need to create? If for every 20 leads I get three, then I know that every day I got to set 20. Now, as a coach, you'd be like, okay, how do we get from three to 10 or three to eight to, to, to make more off the leads? Up. And then always work backwards. But I think people don't, they get into business and say, I'm going to start with this and then go to something else. You really have the end of mind. So, for example, take a look at your space. If I need to make, and the best thing is, if you haven't made a, a uh, you want to make like a million dollars a year, but you haven't made a hundred thousand, that's unrealistic expectation. Start with your first client, first and foremost. Don't worry about anything else, right? So what's the key to your brand new? Number one, fix your mindset. Fear is a choice. False evidence appearing real, real. right? And if you fear nothing, they fear you. And number one, you're probably going to get 99 no's before you get one yes. Okay? Have that mentality. Some of you got 10 no's. Doesn't work. It's a scam. You know, I'm the not meant for that. The whole world is coming yeah, down. Yeah, it's coming down. <laughs> you just have to know. Yeah. Now, once you become more successful, then it becomes 97 yes. There's three no's. Because we also know before we pitch if it's a good deal. Um, number uh, two, get your first client. Get your first customer. Get your first thing. Build that confidence. Don't worry about the yacht, the jets, the lifestyle, the retirement, all this stuff. It doesn't matter. Then, right, figure out what number do I need to quit my job, right, if I have a job. What number? Once I make this. Now, let's say they make 50000 a year. Once I make $150,000 in profit, I'm going to quit. Well, that's stupid because you need to make three times more, right? That, right. So that means you're not an entrepreneur. You're trying to be like, I'm going to make three times more than my job, and then I'm going to quit. At the end of the day, you're, you're either an entrepreneur or you have a job. And there's nothing wrong with having a job. But you got to have an exit number to say, once I hit this number, I'm out of there. Number three, who's going to be your first hire? Because at the end of the day, right now, you're doing everything. And a lot of people say, I'm going to do it on myself. And then when I have money, I'm going to hire the next person. You need to hire your first person. Who is that first person going to be? That person's going to take care of all the transactional. So you're focused on selling, getting more relationships, getting more customers. That's your job. A lot of you think you're going to outsource a bunch of people who sell for you and build a relationship with you. Let me tell you something. If those people were like that, they wouldn't work for you. They'd start their own business, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and then once you have that, then you worry about your first 100000 and then you can focus on your first million as well. There's steps to success, right? You got to crawl. You got to walk. You got to run. You got to sprint. And then once you get over a million, you got to relearn how to rerun again because it's very different from 1 to 10 than 10 to 100. I mean- I was nine figures in my early 30s, right? So um, it's a different way of thinking. The funny enough is the more money I make, the less it's about me and the more it's about my people. I just focus on high-level relationships. I focus 100% of my time on the 1% that matters. When we're coming in, we're pulling in, you're showing some interesting stats about millionaires in America. Yeah. yeah you, want, you want to pull it up? Yeah, I'm going to pull yeah. it up here. So, someone, I, so I was doing a, um, a thing. One of my business partners has had over $2.1 billion in exits and um, – Here's what he said, he put a slide this morning, right? So we have 300 high net worth people, a couple billionaires, lots of nine figures, eight figures this morning. And we're learning the art of this is my next phase of my life, buying, selling businesses. But right now I can do it very creatively because obviously SBA loans are at that all time high. But it's not that most people don't have an exit. So I can put, for example, in your case, five insurance companies together, package them up, then sell them out. Because once it gets over $10 million of revenue, you can have a nine figure exit, right? 
that's what people don't understand. But most people, they're too small for a big player to buy them right now where they're at and too big for a small one to buy. So here's the study said. Uh, 5.3 million people in the United States have a net worth of over a million dollars. 1.4 million have a net worth of over 10. 233, 590 have a net worth over uh, 30 million. 9,630 have a net worth of over 100 million. Woohoo! 724 people have a net worth over a billion. Okay? By the way, that's, that's, that's very encouraging, by the way, to see those type of numbers. I actually yeah. know. I'll tell you why, because if okay. you go on Instagram, let me tell everybody, <laughs> okay, okay. let me give you social media, right? <laughs> For social media. 724 people have a net worth of 100,000 on social media. 963 people, uh, 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 you know, there's 5.3 million people who are billionaires uh, in this country. There's 1.4 million people have a net worth of over nine figures. You see my point? And, and, and in social media... Everybody's a billionaire. Everybody's a nine figure. Everybody's an eight figure. And, yeah, so that's that's and that's the thing. So, but if you think about this, yeah. only ten thousand people. I mean, with three hundred million, have a nine figure. Like that's like wow. That's yeah. like point zero zero one. But even ten million, one point four million. Yeah. Um, but if you take a look online, and I think people, nothing is what it seems. I can't tell you how many people that some of you idolize have come to me during the pandemic, and they ask me for loans or money, and I'm like, yeah. dude, I got you the money. You know, and a lot of times people buy stuff to impress people that that don't even like them. So I, I think people need to find them what's their happiness level. But I, I think all this money, it doesn't matter. Stuff doesn't matter. If you take care of your clients, your clients will take care of your success rate and your happiness level. Bingo. Right? Happy clients, more yeah. money. So rather than focusing like about you, focus on, you know, and also empires are not built on, and same thing in your case in my business, it's not built on a one-time transaction. It's based on LTV, lifetime value. When they come back to you, they yeah. rebuy or they tell other people. That's when you know you're doing something right. Anybody can sell anything one time, right? Can you sell them twice? That's the difference. So the interest rates are coming up. We're facing a recession. No, we're not actually. Okay. No. Okay. Give us, unpack that. Yeah, yeah, no. Okay. The, here's the Everybody was, first of all, like, you know, how many people did like commercials online? Like winter is coming, you know, said yeah. that for three years or yeah, the market's going to crash. It's not going to crash. It's not going to be a recession. Uh, I think the odds just went down. Goldman Sachs and Chase Bull came out and said the odds of recession is only 10%. And I'll tell you why. We all have to have a lot of equity in the homes overall, right? People with high interest rate, wait, what does that mean? That means that if I've got a house and I've got a 4% mortgage or 3.5, right? I'm not going anywhere because if I go anywhere, I'm going to get less house and I'm going to pay more. Oh, yeah. So there's a standstill there, right? And then people have to move either because they have to move, Right. Or they, they, they just, you know, want to move, right? So there's not that necessarily that thing. So it's kind of at a gridlock right now, right? And it's not until rates come back down, which could take a couple, couple years, not to the point of the pandemic, not going to go down to 4%, like people said. It's just going to go down, down. So it's not going to be. Um, the industry of insurance, anything that's service-based, right? Lawn care, plumbing, like HVAC. I just started a, a trade school. Right, lack of plumbers, HVACs, and electrician. Why? Because everybody wants to be a YouTuber, right? Everybody yeah. makes money. You know the amount of people that make money on YouTube is very small. Yeah, very small. Very small, yeah. right? And so the trades—that's the backbone of the American dream. Yeah. Trades and stuff. So yeah. carpenters. And yeah, all that stuff, right? Brick because layers. there's a break there. Yeah, yeah. By the way, you're going to see those rates go up. You're going to yeah. see nurses go up as well. So you're going to see, and of course, that's going to make everything more expensive. Yeah. But they talk about inflation. Where I get my salad, they increase the chicken was like two dollars. Now it's like five dollars to chicken. They said inflation is down. My chicken is still five dollars. So right. um, you know, gas is still very expensive. So at, at the end, it's just the reality of what it is. I think it's never been a, a, a better time because I think creative time. I think it's going to be hard for real estate. Obviously, there'll be still needs because people mm -hmm. who over sense that won't be able to pay. Mm -hmm. Commercial real estate is about to hit for a big crash. That is quite obvious. That's you don't think that they don't, that would trigger a recession. No, uh, commercial real because those are big boys, right? It's not the small guys. It's the big boys. And they got non-recourse loans. Okay. If anything, it might make the banks less likely to give out non-recourse. What non-recourse means that these people put loans and let's say this building was owned uh, that, you know, they're not personally on the hook. So you might see a lot more and say, hey, you lose, you pay. So, so I think that you're, you might see that. But the big, big, big commercial people. You know, they're just saying, here to the bank, here's take the keys. And the banks have made so much money. So the commercial real estate does not impact as much a thing. If residential was, then that would be the backbone. 
multi units, I think rents are, are not going to keep going up. It's just because there's only so much that people can pay, right? So because wages in some cases are not going as high as that. So I think, listen, if we had listened to uh, the economy, we wouldn't have done anything. We would have done nothing in <coughs> April, right? We wouldn't have done nothing in April of 2020, right? Mm-hmm. It was the end of the world. I remember I asked my coach this question. What would Bill Gates and Steve Jobs does, right? Because he was, he was best friends with Gates, best friends with Jobs, worked at Apple, Microsoft. And I said, what would they do? He says, they would double down. He goes, JT, if it's the end of the world, then we're all screwed anyway. It's not going to matter. It's going to be like the movie I Am Legend with Will Smith. It's not going to matter, right? Yeah, when, when, when you're looking at the average person today, you know, making money, and they're, they're having a hard time buying the average home, you know, the person making 15, 20, 25 bucks an hour, they can't buy a three, four, five hundred dollars home with these type of rates. Yeah, but should they? That's the point. Should they? Should, should you buy? Oh, how many guys right now watching this and you want to buy your first house, but you're just not making enough? You're looking at entrepreneurship, you stumble across the channel. Yeah, I mean, you, listen, you, you a good thing for members of the military as yourself, you know, they're able to get VA loans. Sure. No money down. Um, no money down, yeah. right? And so that's really good. It helps out a lot. Uh, yeah. yeah. And then, but then you, but here's the thing, too. You got to figure out if it's easier for me to rent, and let's say I'm going to pay rent of 2500 to, uh, you know, to, to 3500 versus I'm going to get a new home. It's going to cost me five grand, and you're building a business. Maybe it's best for you. Or is it best for you to find a house that needs a rehab, and then you work and you live on it? Huge pain in the butt, but every two years, you can flip it at tax-free. I mean, here's the thing too. Entrepreneurs are short-term sacrifices for long-term benefits. You can have it all, just not at the same time. Let me give you the, there are five things in life, right? But by the way, your position right now is don't, if you're making that type of money, is don't it, go but, buy your house. But is it a good deal? Like, here's the thing okay. too. Like, okay. and, and also you have, but I want you to get back to your point. There, the five yeah, 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 five things. But yeah. is it a good deal? Like there are people sometimes like, you know, I bought a great house. Mm-hmm. And at first I didn't want to. It was in like Nashville, I lived in Chicago, I moved to Nashville and had a house in Florida. And I was like, I want to pay market, right? Now, because of the, I bought it in November, like September 2020, mm-hmm. and then now it's triple. Like, it's a huge house, right? And at the time, I was like, uh, you know, because I'm like, in my DNA, I always have to get a good deal. Mm-hmm. Like, no matter what I bought, it has to be a good deal. I don't like pay market value, but, you know, the best house in the best area with the best views, you're not going to get a discount, right? Yeah. So, so I have to change my mentality. My mentality is like, you know, I brag about shop. I, I have all the stuff. I just don't brag about it. I like bragging about going to Walmart just as a, a, yeah. as a right? roll back, right? Yeah, roll back right. the prices. Yeah. It's, it's the same thing. Yeah. Like, I, you know, hot sauce, right? Um, like hot sauce at Walmart, two thirty seven. you know, grocery store, three thirty eight. uh, whole paychecks. I mean, whole foods, <laughs> uh, like five eighty. same sauce. Yeah, yeah. So, right. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. so, I mean, so I think, um, I think people need to realize like, are they going to do that short-term sacrifice for long-term benefits? So to come back to the five things, there's five things, right? You have wealth, right? You have uh, uh, family. That's your immediate family. You have friends. Those are separate. Um, you have fitness and your health. And you have fun and hobbies. Football, right? Pick three, that's life. Yep. So I pick okay. wealth, right? For me, I treat my clients like family. So that's kind of put that in there. And then I pick health and fitness. I don't even like working out. I don't enjoy it. Doesn't like, but at the end of the day, you have all the money in the world. If you're not healthy, it doesn't matter. But I don't necessarily enjoy it, sure. right? Like I was here in Texas yesterday. I went running at 108 outside. You know, nobody's running. Everybody said it was crazy, but I needed a challenge to push myself, right? And so I like to it do was things high like that. It was, yeah, yeah 108. Um, but here's the point. Why is it this? So let's say you're working six days nonstop, right? Then you come home on Sunday. You're supposed to spend time with your family. But you know what? I'm going to play golf. Right? Or I'm going to hang out with my buddies. Well, then what that happens is now your family, right? Say, hey, listen, you know, just, mm-hmm. you know, hey, you know, you're not giving us the time. Maybe that, that puts a strain on your relationship or strain on your business or divorce. Now it affects your business. There's half your money gone. Yeah. Right? And so there's a lot of times I get invited by friends. And unfortunately, I have to say no. Um, so many cool stuff that I get invited to. Can you come to this premiere? Can you come here? Can you come there? Can you go to the game? Like I got invited this weekend to go to the Alabama Texas game. Like I couldn't go, right? Because I was here and, and we knew we were gonna do this, plus I had something. So I appreciate that, um, you know, I just you know, there's a sacrifice. You can have it all, not at the time. So if I have to give that up, then I give up wealth. Or, you know, I don't want to give up fitness. And also, too, at the end of the day, without family, there's really anything because that is the most important thing. But to go back to that point about family, some people are like, well, I don't want to be an entrepreneur. I don't want to make a lot of money. I don't care about being $100 million or eight figures or something. I just want to be there in the morning for breakfast for my kids, sure. right? I hear that all yeah. the time. So then I say, great. What do your kids now do? Where are they at? Well, you know, I have problems with her and him or that one quit as well. So you know what? It didn't do anything. 
<laughs> because here's the thing: your children do not follow your um, your advice. They the follow your, they, you, you follow your example. Correct. The biggest thing yeah. that everyone watching here is to think to build generational wealth. Generational wealth is a curse because you are going to work very hard, make sacrifices. We're here on a Saturday, right? Recording this, mm -hmm. right? You got your kids' party going on in, a, in about an hour and a yeah, half, and right, right. you got the whole. There's like 400 Filipinos, all related <laughs> to him somehow, right? And they're all there. And but you're here because this needs to be done. Yeah. I'm here, like, and that's what people don't understand. Yeah. There's a a sacrifice that needs to be made. And but what if you say my kids like, oh, I don't want to go to the event, or I don't want to work on Saturday, or, I don't want to do this as well. So then you made all this money that you sacrificed for, and then you're just going to give it to your children ah. who never sacrificed. Yeah. What do you think is going to happen? They're going to buy all the stuff that you never did. Then they're going to realize it doesn't fulfill it. And then often when they don't get fulfilled, they turn to drugs or stuff like that. And then the third generation, then they learn from the mistakes. So I think there's too many people. They're like, I sacrificed the life that, that we didn't have. Well, you know what you're going to do? Your kids are going to do the same. You're great. So you create a generation of non-doers. So you know what? If I die and I have a lot of money, it's all going to go to charity. The people that I love will be taken care of, right? Enough for to be taken care of. And then for charity, it's going to go directly to the people it helps. A lot of these charities, they're, these executives make huge four, five hundred thousand dollar salaries and all these expenses. No, like when I donate to like you know Children's Hospital, like here's a piece of equipment, I'll write the check for the piece of equipment, right? It has to go to the people directly. And I think charity people, for example, are great. They have a big heart. They just don't know how to run a business. So, and that's why the mistake. I want to know what you guys are thinking. Do you guys believe in generational wealth or generational curses? Do you want to pass on an inheritance, wealth, and abundance to your family or not? Please put it in the comment section. Or, or, or if you do, you have like stipulations. If you do this or you do that there or, you, you, you know, maybe very clear. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, listen, I had no money. You had no money. I started with negative $34,000. <laughs> I went then 74 to 34000 Short-term sacrifice, long-term benefits. Like I know what's like to struggle, to eat ramen noodles, to shower at the gym, to sleep on an office couch as well. Now these days, everyone's got an iPhone. Like this, you know, like to them, this is all normal. Like you bring your kids there. Oh, I want Dallas Cowboys. Like, Where's my Wi-Fi? Right. <laughs> yeah. But, but, or, you know, you sit in first class and of course you're not going back to coach, sit back and, and coach with your kids. Right. If you are used to, sure. especially internationally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Cause you're like, I'm not flying eight nine hours. Nine, right. Yeah. Nine hours. Like so, but then your kids are sleeping in, you know, like first class. And, yeah. and then where's that drive? Where is that hunger for greatness? And that's why, and, that's why I think there, the people have to develop like habits. And, and I think a lot of times where kids go wrong now, tell me who your kids hang out with and I will tell you who they will become. Notice I didn't say, don't tell me who your parents are. Mm -hmm. Tell me who the kids. Yeah. And I think a lot of times kids, I mean, if you hang out with, I, I tell the world, you have killer sharks. I did a podcast and I wish you listen to my podcast. Just search JT Fox 2X, Apple, Spotify, number 97. And it was about what's called a killer shark mentality. It's not like it was a killer is wrong. It was a different mentality of what it takes to succeed. And this guy had done $12 billion in assets and he was immigrant telling me the killer shark. And I'm like, wow, that's me. You got killer sharks, you have lions and lioness. Those are people that are driven and stuff like that. But the killer shark is the whole new level. You're a killer shark. Uh, the people you know, you're a killer shark. You know, PBD is a killer shark, right? And we don't mean that in a negative way. Just I mean, it's a mentality. Like we will do what, we don't do our best. We do whatever it takes. And it's just <laughs> no matter what, there is just no failure. I don't care. I'll, I'll, I'd rather, like for me, I hate losing more than I love winning, winning. right? Like yeah. winning last two seconds. Like Tom Brady, what's your favorite ring, right? When I met Tom Brady, it's funny because I brought that up because, you know, you win, it's exciting. And then you're thinking, what do I got to do next year? But if you lose, it bothers you until you win again. Yeah. Like I've never been that type of guy. It's like, oh, you know, you know, everybody's a winner or next time I'll do best. Like I feel bad. Like this wasn't a good podcast. And like, I would feel bad. Like I would be bothered by it. I'd be like, you know, what could I have done better? Because that's what greatness do. That's what Kobe did, right? I mean, I had Phil Jackson at my event. And he goes, Michael Jordan, Kobe. All they kept doing is obsessing on. Well, that's very impressive. Phil Jackson rarely does events. We, yeah, and done event 10 years. Six, 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 Seven years of persistence. Yeah, it was at my last event. And, uh, you said Kobe and, Michael. and by the way, I, I can tell you this. Yeah. Phil Jackson, greatest coach of all time, Coach Michael Jordan, Coach Kobe Bryant. And I would talk to him there. And I couldn't tell if he liked me or didn't like me. He asked me a question. I'd say something. He goes, interesting. Like, no, so like, zen. So zen. But <laughs> I know, know why Kobe so and zen. Michael Jordan, why Kobe Bryant, yeah. like, tried so hard to please. Because no matter what I told Phil, I'd be like, Phil, do you like me? He's like, do you want me to like you? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? I was like, like, I just, I could see why you, you wanted to please them. 
such a nice guy too. And, yes. and, and, um, you know, it's interesting too, because actually enough, I've been thinking about him a lot yeah. and I'm trying to reach back out. I'm like, how much to coach me? I am not basketball. It just, you know, because you know what? I access, felt, I felt, yeah, I mean, I already had yeah. the access. I yeah. think I feel like with Phil Jackson, I'll be like, just in life about how do I go another level? And it's hard because hard to get motivated when you've achieved as much as I did. That's why I'm always, a, I, I live my life as a paranoid optimist. I'm paranoid something's going to go wrong, but I'm optimist I will succeed no matter what, right? It's in my DNA. So I try to like, can do that. But, you know, just this, in the last year, like I've met uh, Lionel Messi in Paris right before he went to, uh, 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 you know, to, to Paris. And I played football with Tom Brady. Um, you know, I, I've, you know, met Michael Dell, who was like, the guy's worth $60 billion, the nicest man ever. Start working with John Paul DeGioia. He's worth $5 billion. Yeah. Patron and Patron, Paul yeah. Mitchell System. Yeah. He also lives in Texas. Yeah, Mr. Slickback. Yeah, 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 such a nice guy. Like, his heart to help people is so good. And even Michael Dell was just like, you're just thinking, like, that's the richest person I've ever met. Like, $60 billion, yeah. right? Yeah. And you're on, I'm on the Dell campus and sitting down in a conference room with him. And I you know the funny thing with me. Any one of my clients who want to come to Brady can come to Brady. I brought one of my clients to go Michael Dell. I brought one of my clients to go meet Messi. Um, I'm going to Red Bull. I'm bringing my clients. Um, whatever I do, my people can come with me. I tell people, if it's good enough for me, it's good enough for me. My business models, I don't like tell people I don't sell courses. I invest in people. Like I've invested $56 million uh, of my own money, my own network's money into people. Because I believe that rather than you give me money, I want to invest with you. Um, and so I changed that model, um, and which has been pretty amazing to have that perspective. Um, and then you realize there's a lot of great people because I don't invest in deals. I invest in people. And same thing with you. Like you, when you have, like you could almost tell right away whether people have experience or not, do they have the it factor? And I will tell you something about this. I love working for people in the military. I tell you why. Number one, they're good at taking orders. The problem is they leave the military. They have no idea what to do because they've been told what to do. Yeah, right. Right. And everything, you know, like the, the what they, they can do and whether it's like, you know, go to war, uh, training, exercise, yeah. you do it so many times, it becomes yeah. natural. Then they go into the world. They have no idea what to do. But I don't know if you, if you notice this or it's just me. Members of the military don't lie. I don't know what it is. They don't lie. Right. And if they say like, sorry, sir. Yep. You're right. Like I'm wrong, sir. Like they, they don't lie. And I've never been betrayed or let down by someone who had, you know, who had served their country. Um, and anybody who put their lives on the line to protect our freedoms. And then, you know, they come back and people are like, oh, thank you for your service, but they don't do shit. You know what I mean? So I, I think I, I take a look at that and I think sometimes, you know, maybe people should walk a mile in people's shoes. Maybe, like I did a lot of business in Africa and I went to some of the poorest area, did very well in Africa, but I went to some of the poorest townships and people are walking, you know, two, two kilometers just to catch six buses, like mm -hmm. the little you know, vans that go to another van and they're super happy and positive, 12 people in a room. And, and, and it wasn't until I walk in other people's shoes. So maybe people, if we just send them in all nowhere in the middle of a desert and they get shot at, maybe they have a different appreciation and perspective. Yep. Maybe yep. people that, you know, you got single mothers who live in impoverished areas, you know, they're working three jobs and unfortunately their kids, you know, they're not there because they're working, trying yep. to provide the family. They're hanging out with, you know, bad people or gang members. Maybe people should go into those areas as well. And I think sometimes we have to look at life from other people's shoes. Now, I don't, look, I don't hear excuses. I don't like excuses. But sometimes we would get a different perspective of what's it be. And also, if you followed me around a day or follow you around, um, you'd realize that we can do more in an hour than you do in a week and sometimes a month, right? Because it's not about time management. It's about energy management. And if you really want to grow, you need to create a stop doing list. Stop doing the stuff that doesn't make you money, that wastes your time. Like, for example, everybody knows smoking is bad and, you know, oh, drinking is over drinking is not good. And, you know, eating McDonald's is bad. Right. And so, you know what? People still do it. You know, they say, oh, because I'm dying something or it's easier. People have that self-control. Your mind is stronger than your excuse. Profound. So, JT, you speaking of military, you're here in the, the red, white and blue. Mm -hmm. You look very, uh, very presidential today. Well, I'll be honest, I, if I wear jeans and a polo or a t-shirt, I'm the same person, except I don't get the respect. Funny enough, Interesting. It, it, you know, image brave. is everything. Yep. Like when you're successful, you can dress like the green Hulk. And, <laughs> you know, but if you were broke, I probably wouldn't take you seriously. Uh, honestly, if you're sure, dressed sure, all sure. in green, and yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Cause I'd be like, it's a gimmick, right? Yep. There, there was a woman, I did a speech uh, at a conference, right? And sometimes we allow people to speak at our conferences to give them a shot, right? Yep. The, the moment, cause normally yep. we just have successful people. 
And her message was very high level, high net worth people, strategies that I do for accounting, right? So I knew she does. But she came in with the money gun and, and the throwing the dollar bills and stuff like that. Um, she rated one of the top speakers, the top speaker at the event. And here was the lesson. Broke people loved her, but they couldn't afford her. People with money could afford her thought it was gimmicky and didn't relate to her. So who are you trying to relate Ouch. to? Ouch. So you may have won the best speaker, but here's the thing. People with money. Because you know that you called yourself a queen or the king. Gimmicks don't work. Look at the world's most successful. You don't. You know, sometimes they somebody else calls them that, not them. Yeah, correct, exactly, yeah. right. When you start calling yourself that, I mean, it was oh, how are you the world's number one wealth and business coach? Well, you know, I do business in fifty-five countries. I have clients in four, and I've actually spoken in fifty-five countries. So it's a little hard. There's nobody else in the world who's done what I do. And also, too, when you get paid over a million dollars to do what you do, chances are not too many people, right? For sure. And Tony Robbins is the life strategist, and I'm the business guy, right? But it's not even like I don't even like the reference as a coach because. It's all watered down. Like everybody's a coach now. Like people are like, I want to be a life coach. Well, do you have any money? No. Then why would you be there? Because I have life experience. Yeah, what not to do, right? Like I think you have to be successful. Then you teach people you're successful. But you have to lead by example. I think there's too many people who want to do things without leading by example. So we're, you're from Canada, raised in Chicago. Mm -hmm. We got an election coming up. Mm -hmm. what's, what's your thoughts on, on what's going on in America today? And wow. how can you know, really, the, the, the country is completely divided. Uh, obviously, everyone knows it's becoming woke, um, you know, and at the end of the day, if you're um, here's the problem. Right. So if I tell people, let's say Donald Trump, right, you say Donald Trump and there's two types of people like, yeah, my God. And then you got people who just heard Donald Trump. They're like convulsing. Right? They're like, I just said Donald Trump. Right. And some people may have tuned out. Right. But I, I should tell people this. Right. If I go to people who love Donald Trump. Right. And I know him. Right. And I know the family. And I say, name me one bad thing that he did. They can't name me one thing. Then if I go to people who, who hate Donald Trump. He stole documents. He stole this. Blah, blah, blah. Right, no, 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 no. But this is the people who love him. Oh, yeah. okay. Right? Oh, the gotcha. people love him. Okay. okay. If people hate them, I said, you know what? Just tell me one thing that he did that he did well for the country. Just one. And they can't. Because we live in a society, yeah. and part of it is driven by the news cycle. If you hate something, everything is bad. You can't say, you know what? And, and the right move with Trump would be like, all right, his policies worked, right, clearly. If it wasn't for COVID, you know, mm -hmm. everything was high. But... People didn't like, and the reason people didn't vote for him, right, was single white, sorry, women, white women in the burbs. So, so, yeah, because so. they didn't like the petty stuff. Mm -hmm. okay? They didn't like the, the name calling. Yeah. Now, for me as a businessman, if I'm running again and someone says to me, um, someone says to me, hey, don't use names because that's why you lost and you call it election fraud or whatever, right? And here's the thing. Was there some... Things that were maybe off, yes, but at a mass scale, no. Here's what happened. It was a pandemic. Everybody's at home. Facebook and Instagram said, sign up the vote, sign up the vote, sign up the vote. Every post that you did, right, right. they sign up the vote. Record Gen Z. Any of those people had to show up the vote, they never would have showed up the vote because you had record voting, right? So because that's really what happened. And at the end of the day, um, you know, you know, it came down to, to, you know, that premise about, for example, in the Trump thing is that, is that I would not do that. And then he started off by calling Rand, Ron DeSantis' name, right? Because a man who is 74, in this case, 78 now, 70s, mm -hmm. yeah, 78, 70, yeah. right? Who was a billionaire, who made it, who everyone says he wouldn't be president. Everybody says not to do things, and he made it. So people say, well, it's not presidential. You don't change as a 76-year-old man. <laughs> you are who you are. are. You either like it or you don't. But as a society, we have to say, I like this, I don't like this. And at the end of the day, I don't think you should look as a party, right? I like this thing. I like this thing. But we live like we're too polarizing. That's why elections are not decided by Republicans. They're not decided by Democrats. They're decided by the independent. The, yeah, the, and those yeah, are the people the folks, who are going to say, you know what? I like this. I don't like this. I don't like this. Now, here's the thing. Even if you hate Donald Trump, okay, you have to sort of admit that, listen, if it was the same thing, like they went after the documents on Trump. And Biden had documents that didn't do anything, right? And if it was Don Jr. that did what Hunter Biden has done, the gun charges, the, the yeah. documents, the, the, the payoffs in Ukraine or whatever it is, right? Yeah. Or Trump the, did, the, 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 it would the, be insane, right? With Trump, they went after Russia and it turned out to be a hoax that it was not true. Fake dossier, now, right? Right? But nobody came back and said, you know what? I don't like the guy, but I accept he hasn't done that because – People don't like being wrong. There's mm. only one thing worse than being wrong, dead wrong. 
And so you have to take a look at the whole world. I do business around the world is laughing at the United States for indictments. So crazy. You know what I mean? And by the way, right before the election, um, you know, and by the way, not one person got prosecuted. And I live downtown Chicago, the riots. Not, that's why I moved. Not once, not twice. Not one person got prosecuted. And of course, what happened to Capitol Hill is like, doesn't look good and didn't look good. And, you know, people are going to jail for 22 years. It's like almost a, a double standard. And by the way, that's how it works. And so I think people just need to focus on themselves. And that is why people have to keep their circle small. Because if you disagree with me right now, nothing I say is going to change your mind. And if you agree with me, right, then nothing I say is going to change your mind because you agree with me. And I would recommend everybody to say, or even if you don't like someone, I don't like this. Like, there are people I don't like. I cannot stand. But I'd be like, but I respect them because they've done this and this right. I'm not all, I hate them. And if I love somebody else, I'd be like, you know, I was joking. Like, um, you know, there's sometimes a celebrity. It's like, I really like them. And I'm like, dude, really? You have to sell your soul to be in this, this ad? You know what I mean? Like, how much more money do you need? Yeah. But I know the person, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and, and I think we live in a world where it's not going to get any better. And just even you bringing up politics, maybe like, wow, this was a great interview until they start talking about that. And I didn't tell you I like Donald Trump. I didn't tell you I hate Donald Trump. And by the way, his right-hand man, George Ross, was my first coach. He's a celebrity apprentice judge. He's 95 years old. He's responsible for me building a nine-figure empire. So I know a lot of things because I also know the family. I know a lot of things that people don't know. So, And there's a lot of stories I could have brought up. I probably look good, would not look good. And I know a lot of stories that would make it look good. And so we live in a world that it just, at the end of the day, it just doesn't matter. And you could just... You know, we get canceled and there's a lot of things that come back and, and you know, I, I, this is the way it is. I mean, you know, like we talk about Me Too and, and um, the BLM movement, which was a huge, huge, big, huge topics. Well, you know, allegedly the founders of BLM basically bought a bunch of houses and, right, a bunch of houses yeah. and cars and stuff yeah. like that, right? And BLM, they all, uh, sorry. Uh, they large. They, yeah, yeah, Me Too movement, same yeah. thing, or Time's Up, yeah. allegedly. So, you know, at the end of the day, and then the corporates are feeding this, yeah. just like now you have the ESG model where, the, uh, you know, BlackRock and, 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 and um, Blackstone, and, and it's just, History yeah, it, it's all, here's the thing too. Is the system rigged? Yes, it's rigged. And by the way, nothing you can do about it. You just got to live your life and play by the rules that you're going to be. But it is rigged. It's rigged against some people that unfortunately can never be successful because of certain characteristics. And then there's some people who are never going to do anything because they got all these bailouts. How many people do you know got PPE money and wasted on things that had nothing to do with employee and they have no accountability? How many people did crypto raises, right? And ICOs. lost all money, ICOs or NFT projects with uh-huh. no accountability. Yeah, exactly. So you know what? A lot of people got rid of a lot dumps. of yeah, yep. pump and dumps, right? So a lot of people got taken advantage and nothing happens. And you know what? You know, I, I tell people, it's like, you know, it is, I, I'll give an example, right? This is a little controversial. I got vaccinated. And, you know, it wasn't necessarily like there, but when you lived in Chicago, you're like, you couldn't do anything and you were going to die. And you lived in Florida or Texas, it was like holidays, right? <laughs> but my, both my parents were dying. So I had to make a decision. Do I need to go? Um, do I need to go to Canada to go? Even though I have a Canadian passport, you have to be vaccinated, right? And so I had to make a decision. Oh, you can enter the country? Right, to enter the country. Yeah. So, so let me ask you the question. If you, you're, both your parents are dying, Right. By the way, both were alcoholics. It's like, so, you know, I'm completely opposite to them, but I didn't want that on my conscience. So I got, I had to travel to London. I traveled for Greece where I did one of my biggest deals. I traveled to Australia, all which I'd be vaccinated. Now, the point is, could you got a fake fax card? The answer is yes. But I looked at it. My lawyers looked at it at the time. I didn't know what's going to happen. If I get a fake fax card and I get pulled over, I could be charged, right, with a crime. And that's what they initially said. Mm-hmm. And was it worth to ruin my whole uh, my whole like future over getting a fake fast card, risk or reward, you know, best case scenario. I get it. Nobody knows. Worst case scenario. I get pop. I make the news, yeah. Yeah. right? I make the news and who knows what can happen, detain jail. I, you know, what's the most likely we didn't know what was going to happen, right? years, but here's the difference with yeah. me. People who didn't want to take it. I respected their decision. I'm like, if that's right for you and your family, God bless. Yeah. That was the difference with people. You make, you make them feel guilty. Yeah, and now people are like, oh, if you're vaccinated, I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to go on a date with you. Like, that's, just, <laughs> like, that's just stupid. I think we have to learn how to respect people's decisions, uh, people's decisions. Um, you know, and a lot of times I think, I think what's wrong with our society now, it's the school systems. Like parents are not Oof. undertaking the, the, 
their children's because they spend more time at school, right? So if they go to school and say, I hate Trump, I hate Trump, I love Trump, I love Trump, you know, then they get indoctrinated by it. Same thing with the kids. Like, what do you think happens when the parents talk at the dinner table or they go to protest, they bring these little kids. Mm -hmm. these, these kids didn't make decisions on their own. Or the teachers. Yeah, they're, they're being brain fed their situation. Big difference between red states and blue state. But the difference is, I like Democrats, I like Republicans because at the end of the day, you're American or wherever you're listening to the show. Or you know what, better what? You're, you're, you're a child of God. And so I don't judge anyone, you know? I don't, I, I remember when, when the BLM came in, I was being interviewed. And I'm like, I've never seen color. Like I treat everybody the, the same. Sure. Like, I don't care, black, white, yeah, purple, yeah. green. Yeah. And then I got attacked. Like, That's the problem. You don't say anything different. I'm like, what are you talking about? I've always respected. I've never treated anything. Now I'm being, and, and then they start, I had never heard this term, for example, from Canada, like white privilege. And I'm like, what, what, what is that? well, because it's like, and here's the thing. I didn't choose the color of my skin. Neither did black people, mm -hmm. right? Maybe black people or, or Filipino or Asians mm -hmm. or, or other or Indians to say, you know what? Yeah. I wouldn't want, I want to be white. And also, none of us chose the country uh, uh, of our choice. I'm sure there's a lot of people living in other countries that say, I wish I was in America or Canada or the UK or someone else like that. We don't choose our parents. We don't choose the color of our skin. We don't choose where we're born. So I don't know why anybody's discriminating when we don't even choose the color of our skin. And you know what? White people like to get a tan. So I don't know. I always figured it was weird. Like, they, I don't know. Like, you know, they, they want to get darker. Tan. Yeah. I don't see any whitening telescopes. I see any darkening telescopes, right? But I think we need to learn how to embrace. And I think there's too many people who are concerned about the opinions about everybody else. Whatever someone thinks about you is none of your business. A lot of you are concerned about the opinions of people, friends, family, or enemies or haters that are never going to buy your product. They're never going to invest with you. So who cares what they say? Why are we concerned with that? Slam dunk. Before we wrap up, give me give me a. Uh, is it like this? Or yeah, that's a trademark. Uh, Sorry, that's a trademark. Uh, we do the Michael sorry. Jordan. We do the trademark. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah I don't want to get sued by Mike. Um, going into twenty twenty three, going into years going forward, we've both came from nowhere and got somewhere in our lives and had a lot of success because of capitalism, because of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that uh, a lot of people today would rather lean on government or lean on the job. So give, give us a wrap right. up. Give Listen, me a not case. A, but not everybody is meant to be an entrepreneur. Okay. Like entrepreneurism is this. We are putting our whole lives on the line to live the rest of our life like most people want, but never will. We make the short-term sacrifice, long-term benefits. We could easily take a pay, work Monday to Friday, you know, and how about that, and settle. We just choose not to settle because we are seeking greatness. We're seeking the best version of ourselves. That is entrepreneurism. That is true entrepreneurism. So here's the thing, there's a lot of people that are also meant to be entrepreneurs, right? You know, like my CEO, she sure. started off as lowest paid employee, now she's the CEO of all my companies, right? Amazing woman. And by the way, I like women, I think women are better at business than men, right? Uh, I think like 95% of my organization is women, right? Um, they do an amazing job. Uh, they're great. And now I'll give her pieces of all my companies too. So she's an entrepreneur because she started her own probably would be a successful no. So, so she's a great number two. Oh yeah, great right. number two. Yeah. But you or know what, I treat her the, but you know what, yeah. I give, here's the difference with me. I give her all the credit. I give everybody all the credit. Like I don't care about credit. Like here's the thing, who cares? Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like you think you made me successful, God bless. You know, I give other people credit because it's not about me, right? It's about we. That's the difference. It's not about me, it's about we. Because I can't make it without you. Yeah. You can't make it without me. So, but I also know that I build this without you and I can build a bit without bigger without you too as well, right? Um, because there's no such thing as a self-made man or woman. I and, and, and I think uh, in the end, you know, one of my favorite quotes is, when you want to succeed as bad as you want to breathe, then you're going to make it. And that's me. And so to me, I went to, if I'd start all over, I'd start all over again. I don't care about money. Um, to me, it's all about this. And by the way, you take a look, I do very few podcast interviews, like, 99.9% .9 I turned it down. You know, I said yes to you because oh, of our past relationships, of right? Um, because look, it's an hour and I, I know what my hours worth, right? I know how much I make per hour, mm -hmm. which is quite a bit. And then, you know, we drive back, so it's two hours. But you know what, to me, knowing that these people are watching, knowing that you and I, you know, I was a bit more successful than you back then, but I was just starting and you were just starting to where you come in, pick me up in a nice car, I had a feet massage and everything. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, mean, I was treated, right? But and now in these nice places. And then I've never been here. So for me, just to come see this, uh, where we are here, where your offices are and the Dallas Cowboys, to me, that's cool. So here's the thing too. Um, you don't live once, you live every single day, you die once. And here's the thing too. No one ever dies about, ah, I wish I hadn't done this or started a business. They die with the things they wish to regret. You got one life. You got one chance. 
That's all you got. You have one chance. And by the way, you need to go for it. And a lot of you are trying to live in the afterlife, right? In the afterlife. What if you come back as a cat? Did you ever, like, what if you wonder if you come back as a cat? So you know what? You got to go all in 24-7, 365, because at the end of the day, that's what life is about. Because becoming the best version of yourself, trying to find that, which you're going to realize you never will, because you could always do more. You could always help more people. You could always be a better human as well. But at least go for it. That's the biggest advice I'd say. So mic drop. Let's go. All of JT's information we've been showing here on the Lone Thursday entire podcast. Make sure you put it in the yeah. Follow me on Thursday Instagram. Right? Send me a message. Let me know what you think as well. Yeah, and I also sometimes do some free coaching uh, once a month. I coach people for free just for the sake of it as well. And who knows? Maybe you want my money for your business, especially if you're being working with this guy. I know. I know he's going to motivate you. Go. Yeah, because we're, we'll be the Avengers, <laughs> like Hulk, and I'll be like Captain America, even though I was born in Canada, and have a U.S. passport. <laughs> Captain Canada yeah. and America. Yeah. That would be like a good reel there, like Hulk and Captain America. I'm, I'm dressed up like I'm running for president. We're great. We've got Matt Chipola. The guy's green. <laughs> green is the best color. Nobody does it better than green. I love green. Money's great. I love money. We're going to make money greener again. It's going to be great. It's going to be fantastic. You're bigly. Nobody is bigger than him. I'm telling you, these arms are huge. <laughs> That's me at the beginning of this. <laughs> Folks, you got JT Fox. And if you've been watching, make sure you subscribe to YouTube. We didn't channel. even talk about Batman Hollywood <laughs> movies. We didn't talk about DJ Mega Fox. We didn't talk about any of that stuff. <laughs> now gonna be like, who's this comedian? We got to do round two. We got to do round two in the full show. That's, uh, in, 10 years, yeah. in ten years. In ten years that we met ten years ago, we'll do part two in ten years, where you'll be super gray, yeah. and I will have, gotcha. I will have fake hair. That's it. All right, guys. Appreciate you guys. Make sure you jump your comments below. You agree with us? You don't agree with us? Let us know. What is I? Why mind? would you agree? That being said, from why are you trying to create controversy? <laughs> controversy? Why would you not agree? Let's go. We got the green machine we here. Want engagement, baby. We want engagement. And by the way, let's all celebrate by drinking green, green juice. Yeah, sure. Let's say that. Smoothies and more. Only green. This is healthy yes. and natural. To meet again, Katila. This smart Katila. And make sure, and make, make sure you get insurance too, so that if the green smoothie doesn't go down, you're protected. And be money smart today. <laughs>